She is a part of UTC and is uh, one of the members of the hub here in Paris. And I'm also a tenure researcher of Argentina's National Research Council, the CONICET, at least while it still exists. Having said this, um, and here you have my email, my personal email and, and my Twitter account, and I can also give you my, my UCL email if you wanted. This is not a biology class, clearly, or maybe it is, and I got you all confused into this room. But, or maybe, because for some people actually, well, humans are animals, so in the end when we study economics, when we study human cultures and human experiences in a particular moment in time that we describe and we call as capitalism, in a way we're also studying biology, just a narrow part of humans, uh, of living beings' behaviors, in particular for humans and in particular in a context that is capitalism. But it's not because of that that I have these animals here. Uh, it's because two of the key concepts that we are going to discuss today in relation to how intellectual monopoly power is built and the trajectories of what I describe as intellectual monopoly power in the digital age concern two behaviors. One is cannibalism. So those that are at the apex uh, will be at the peak in the, in the animal kingdom, let's say, uh, eating each other. And uh, the other one refers to predation and how those that are at the top, in, the, in our case, we will see that appropriate not only value, but also knowledge from those that are at uh, different subordinate layers. So this is why I wanted to start with this. And I also wanted to start with some uh, stylized facts, um, just to set the scene. I'm going to focus today on relations among organizations between different types of organizations. And we need to have in mind that, in particular, when we think of firms of enterprises, there is a concentration of profit. So inequality is not only something that happens between labor and capital, but also inside mm -hmm. capital we see an unequal distribution of profits. And at the same time, we, uh, or, or in particular with different colleagues, but one of the things that we are interested in is identifying what drives this concentration and what are the effects at different levels of this concentration. And in terms of a stylized facts, something that um, it's quite clear is that the companies that are concentrating more profits are simultaneously the ones that are capturing most of the different forms of knowledge and turning them into intangible assets. And here on the slides you have some stylized facts. Uh, the first one refers to the Standard & Poor's 500 firms and how from uh, some decades ago when most of the assets of these companies were tangible assets, machines, factories, like everything that was put inside the factory that had a tangible side, from that, uh, we live in an era where most of the assets of these companies are intangible assets. Most of the value of these companies' assets are, uh, correspond to intangible assets. And another way to see this is by looking at the concentration of patents. In particular, the indicator refers to uh, the IP5 patents, which are inventions that were patented simultaneously in the five largest patent office. offices. We will see that patents are a very, uh, to say the least, a very incomplete indicator of knowledge capture, knowledge appropriation, and intellectual monopolization. But at the same time, they're a good starting point. More or less, all of you, although most of you are not part of Major A, know what a patent is. So it spares me from starting from saying, OK, a patent is this or that. And you can already see that the largest companies in the world, OK, they are capturing a lot of patents. And also, that most of the business expenditure on R&D, this is the ERD, uh, is concentrated in two sectors, ICT, be them software and, uh, or hard work, and healthcare. But more generally, although today I will be focusing a lot on, on digital technologies, and I will also be referring to healthcare, more generally, what I'm trying to convince you of today is that all forms of knowledge and information are increasingly being monopolized by leading corporations. And this explains the redistribution of value, and it also explains how value is produced. So to understand all this, we will cover a quite long outline in today's uh, seminar. And I will try to um, be very fast in all this because I really want to listen to the students that will be discussing about this and also to have a lot of time for Q&A. So let me just say that here in this picture, you have the 20 largest companies in market capitalization in the world. And if you look at them, uh, it's not only obvious that some of them, the largest ones, are tech companies, but and that there are a lot of pharma companies. 
And there are many tech companies that are not classified as tech. They're all Another thing that will come up after I expect so at least this seminar is that the ways in which we classify industries are also becoming quite inaccurate because these companies are entering different sectors and because digital, digital technologies in a way are permeating into every single sector. So classifying Amazon as a consumer discretionary company, okay, I mean, they can, like, it's okay. This, um, this comes from visual capitalists that do amazing uh, posters and, and diagrams and I totally recommend you to have a look at what they are doing from many different topics, not only economics and, and not particularly innovation or companies. Okay, we'll leave it. We, I'm, I'm not going to argue at this point that the classification into sectors is wrong, although we will see that, uh, that it's uh, at least it leaves a lot of open questions. But what I want to highlight is regardless of all um, the division between sectors, we have two types of companies here, basically. We have companies that base their power in the concentration of intangible assets and companies that base their power on the appropriation of nature. And I will be focusing therefore on all these, so everyone but the red ones. But the red ones also exhibit a rentier dynamic. It's just that it's of a different nature and is uh, not a self-reinforcing one as we will see uh, for the case of intellectual monopolies. So again, if you're interested, we can. Um, I may refer to some examples about other companies like McDonald's or L'Oreal or Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola. So it's not that I will only be referring to digital uh, technology or digital companies or tech giants today. And uh, in order to make sense of this and why the, this framework is not only addressing specifically big tech companies, what we will do today is discuss a bit about the genealogy of intellectual monopolies. So how did we um, arrive at a moment in capitalism where value is organized, the production of value is organized, and the redistribution of value is organized by these intellectual monopolies. Then we will move towards planning and industrial stratification and predation. So we're not going to uh, just think that the outcome of this process are different uh, types of markets, but beyond that, how these companies have the capacity to plan portions of the economy. And then I will give you a lot of empirics about this, how to identify and classify intellectual monopolies, and we will look at the specificity of big tech, which will lead us to discuss about AI, the cloud, and finally, if we have the time, some interplay with political powers, in particular with the US and the Chinese state. So, just to, as, as a starting point, uh, the way I see intellectual monopoly capitalism arriving and becoming so prevalent is by the uh, conjunction of four things. One refers to the ways in which knowledge is produced. Knowledge is not produced like shoes or like cables, but knowledge is produced on the basis of existing knowledge. This doesn't mean that the evolution of knowledge is linear, that everything that comes out now will be necessarily better than what was written before. Actually, it doesn't happen more often than not, and we know this in economics in particular. <laughs> but uh, we cannot neglect that there is a path dependence. And those that are constantly producing knowledge, those that are at the knowledge frontier, will be better prepared. We'll have a larger, what the literature calls, absorptive capacity to make sense of the knowledge that is out there in the environment and to also keep on producing new knowledge on the basis of all the knowledge that is in the environment and the knowledge that the firm has already uh, integrated into its production processes are, and largely operates with. So this leads us to a situation where those that have innovated once, in principle, although all the economic literature say or tend to think that after one innovation, Eventually, the rest of the firms of the industry will catch up or leave. Some may leapfrog, some may imitate, or may, different things may happen that in the end lead us to a situation where the innovation, the effect of the innovation vanishes. Instead of that, it is actually, if we take into account these conditions of how knowledge is produced, it actually makes more sense to think that the company that has innovated once will have higher chances to innovate again before the rest have managed to catch up. It is, a, it is a possibility. I'm not saying that it is what necessarily happens, but at least it is a possibility. And it's a quite feasible one, considering past dependence and this absorptive capacity, together also with this idea of uh, management on translation capacity, because it's not that the knowledge automatically available out there can be as such applied 
inside the firm. There will be some translations, there will be some transformations that typically the literature will describe as adoptions of the knowledge or the technologies that are out there. All in all, we can expect on this basis to have a process of industrial stratification with some firms that keep on winning the innovation race and some others that remain laggards. Laggards that may try to imitate those that are at the frontier at different speeds, and we will discuss about the types of subordinate or laggard films in one second, but at least we have the possibility that in the literature, I insist, was not considered, and I will come back to this later on, we have the possibility of having industrial stratification. If we add to this picture that at least since the Second World War and, and fast forwarding as we speak, doing R&D becomes more and more expensive, those that have already innovated will have a financial leeway. Those that have already innovated will have more financial resources because they will be capturing an, a rent associated with the innovation. And therefore, they will have more money to invest in more R&D. And that means that they will, again, be having higher chances to innovate again before the rest. Of course, it is impossible to think of the emergence of this new era in capitalism driven by intellectual monopolization without looking at institutional and political transformations. And here, typically people would think of the emergence of a stringent intellectual, international intellectual property rights regime, at least since the 1980s, with the Beidol Act in the US. For those of you that haven't heard of this, the Beidol Act basically authorized uh, research that was uh, conducted with public money to be patented. This spoke directly to universities but also to public research organizations. While this was happening, public research organizations and also universities were pushed to open technology transfer offices. At the same time that all this was happening, the US state authorized pension funds to become venture capitals. And it was a moment when venture capital was quite scarce in the US. And this push for more money that also came directly by US state agencies, the CIA, the NASA themselves became bent to capitals as well. On top of all these transformations that took place since the 80s, by mid 1990s and pushed by companies like Pfizer, IBM and uh, Microsoft, the US state started convincing countries around the world that they needed to transform their intellectual property rights regime into one that looked more alike the one that the US had. The US had not only in all this time conducted a lot of transform uh, regulatory transformations that pushed for more patenting and more intellectual property rights, but also expanded what could be patented. And it started including among the things that could be patented, living beings and copyrights. And probably those of you that discuss a bit about commons may have already heard about this. On top of this, the length of the intellectual property rights was also expanded. So overall, we have a more stringent intellectual property rights regime since the 1980s in the US that then was translated into the rest of the world. It's not that the countries in the rest of the world were stupid. They were forced, in a way, to do so in negotiations that included trade negotiations. So basically, the US, con the US multinational corporations convinced European multinational corporations to push the European states to work together with the US state for the TRIPS, which ended up being the TRIPS agreement. And they do so because they dislike the fact that companies around the world were more or less copying what they were patenting, which had been actually what the US had done before when it became, before becoming a world power, what Germany did even before and so on. So in, this, in the history of how countries uh, became superpowers over the years, they all, in a way, stole knowledge from those that were at the frontier. But anyway, as this was taking place, developing countries uh, didn't, like the representatives of the developing countries were not aware of the complexities of how knowledge is produced and the complications that a more stringent intellectual property rights regime would, be, would bring for their countries. And when you go to these negotiations, at the World Trade Organization, you have an agenda as a country, and as a poor country or a middle income country, you don't have a chance to negotiate and bargain for everything. You know that you will lose and you need to pick your battles. 
And for these countries, what was urgent was to assure the uh, entry of dollars. And therefore, they couldn't afford the fact that the US was threatening with not buying things and Europe as well, if they were not having the sufficiently strict intellectual property rights regime that they wanted. So all this story ends with all the countries in the world eventually, China, for China it took longer, accepting this TRIPS agreement. But in fact, the emergence of this intellectual property rights regime, the one that we have now, and the transformations should be traced even not from the 1980s onwards, but we should actually go even a century before that, at a moment that was crucial and that now is often just accepted, which is the moment when inside the, do you want to ask a question? Yes. On the strips uh, system, uh, where are disputes where are disputes litigated? Uh, they are, that's a very good question because, in fact, in principle, disputes should be litigated at the World Trade Organization. So, associated with us, disputes of thinking of encapsulating knowledge in patents as commodities. So, the patents and there was even an attempt to create markets for patents that never worked as such. And we will also, in a bit, understand why because the patents are just, in the end, a way to prevent others from accessing knowledge, but they are not the most important appropriation mechanism. It's just a way to limit the others, but the ways in which intellectual monopolies capture rent are not by charging others a, a, la, a royalty for licensing the content of their patents. Actually, more often than not, the contents of the patents are impossible to read because they write the description of the patent in a way that makes it very hard to really understand what's happening there. And this is also part of the reasons, but we will get to this, why these companies can afford to put portions of the knowledge that they use for intellectual monopolization in open source anyway. But we will get there. So, and I say that it's important because when it comes also to digital technologies, nobody knows. The answer is nobody knows where to litigate. And, and there is a very interesting piece that I can share with all of you. It's kind of a draft that speaks about different cases where Nobody knew where the, the trials should take place, basically, and who was responsible if it was in one country, in another, if it was in international, um, like in, in, in international, I don't have the name of where the trials takes place, that place, the court. court, court, thank you so much, in international courts or where. But let's go back to history. Late 19th century, what happens is that between the late 19th century and the for its part of the 20th century, knowledge that was produced inside the factory stopped being considered the property of the person that had produced it. The employee stopped being the owner of the knowledge that they had produced. And now you think, okay, this is obvious. What you produce inside the factory belongs to the owner of the factory. But actually before it was not like that. And all this change with the emergence of the modern corporation as, a, as an entity that could own even other companies that could own all sorts of assets, including owning intangible assets, including owning the knowledge that their employees had produced. And this uh, was introduced, the, what ended up being the trade secret clause, was introduced in the work contracts of uh, the employees over the course of the early 20th century. So in a way, we see two moments in time that are of utmost importance. One is when knowledge stops being the associated with the producer of the knowledge, the person that produced it or the people that produce it inside the lab, but with the owner of the means of production that were used to produce that knowledge. And this uh, formally took place by the end of the 19th century and early 20th century. And the second moment that can be considered a second moment of the embodiment of knowledge, which is when knowledge stopped being embedded in machines. It's not that before knowledge was not relevant. One thing is, I, of course, as we speak, the production of knowledge accelerates and in a way we can say that it's becoming more and more important. But it's not that before it wasn't important. It was just that most of the knowledge that was produced ended up resulting in new machines. This is why in developing countries, uh, introducing technology was almost like a synonym to importing a machine. Because the technology, the new knowledge, was encapsulated, embedded in the machine. Whereas now we have two things. The machine, let's say, is produced with aluminum, steel, whatever, and the knowledge that is separated conceptually from the machine with a patent or with a copyright, or 
uh, since the 1970s, something that is quite illustrative of this uh, separation in, in, uh, in a, like from a sensitive perspective, is the separation between hardware and software. Because before, software didn't exist. Software was basically introduced with and coming with the hardware. And it was IBM in the 1970s who decided to separate it and decided to be the main integrator of what IBM assumed to be the key piece of this technology, which was supposed to be the computer, but it ended up being the software. And this, in a way, paved the way for Microsoft. <coughs> this, I, I will not have time today to discuss a lot of this. We can come back if you want in the Q&A. But let me highlight that in terms of institutional and political transformations that led to the state of capitalism that we see these days, we can not only think of the evolution of the intellectual property rights regime, but also to other things. Largest companies in the world pay uh, as a proportion of their profits a lower uh, income tax than the rest of the companies in the world. So the companies that are the most profitable, the largest ones, they pay less taxes in proportion to what they are earning. And this uh, is the result in part of known loopholes in the international regulations. Known by whom? By the US government, by the different governments in the world, and not only now. It's not that now everybody knows that these companies are not paying taxes and that it's a problem. Already <laughs> by the 70s and 80s, this was known and uh, it was, and nothing was done, let's say. We cannot say whether, uh, what, what was the driver of this decision, but nothing was done even back then. Although there is an account of the US government knowing the existence of these loopholes. We also know that antitrust was weakened. And this, one could say, OK, this affected uh, or contributed to the concentration of uh, every single market. But it particularly favored some of industries over others. And these are the industries that are not directly selling to consumers. Because the Chicago School, you know, like the, the most extreme versions of neoclassical economics coming together with neoliberalism, focus only on consumer welfare. And if what is being sold is not sold directly to consumers, but for instance to states, to governments, such as healthcare, a lot of the treatments, the most expensive ones, are paid by the state directly, not by us. And therefore, the process in which it becomes obvious for the antitrust agencies that they need to go after the companies takes much more time or never happens. And if you think about the case of platforms, in the case of platforms, it's even uh, more uh, obvious that because of how the platforms operate, sometimes pretending to be giving us things for free and just actually uh, charging us with our data or charging us less because also they get our data and because they capture value from the others that participate in the platform. Uh, when we just look at the consumption part of this story at consumers, consumers seem to be better. At the same time, consumers are better in terms of that specific market, but these are the same consumers that are workers earning less and less as we speak and facing now inflation, inflationary processes all around the world. So yes, things are cheaper on Amazon.com that may be in the shop around the corner, but we have less money to spend. So overall, it's not that the consumer is better. It's just this narrow way of seeing uh, an economic process that has favored the concentration, in particular in some, I, I insist, industries or sectors. And then also, the story of the US hidden industrial policy, the NASA, the moonshot projects, and so on is quite known. Uh, especially these days that there has been a so-called revival of industrial policy. But in fact, what is perhaps less known is that the US state never stopped investing in science and technology and transformed its industrial policy into a science and technology policy. What happened is that it lost the capacity to plan the sectors. During the time of the Cold War, it was planning the development of, for instance, semiconductors, deciding which were going to be the companies receiving the procurement money, which were going to be the universities developing the technology. From that moment when the US state was planning the development of a whole industry, semiconductors, and we did the development of certain uh, technologies in particular associated with it, we moved to a situation where that role was taken over by corporations. So it's not just a matter of looking at how much money or whether the narrative that the presidents of the United States are using 
include the word, the word industrial policy or not, but to look beyond that at whether that, industrial, that money that is being spent is associated with a concrete plan on how to steer orient the development of the technology and certain industries, or just pouring money, responding to a requirement of the concentrated capital, which is what is happening even today, and I can come back to this later on. So, summing up a brief definition of intellectual monopolies. These are not one-time innovators. These are not companies that had a like, one-shot amazing innovation. What we're looking at, is at here is at companies that are continuously capturing knowledge and turning it into intangible assets. The knowledge that they capture, the information, the data, may not be produced inside these R&D laboratories. But still they are capable of transforming it, appropriate it, and transform it into assets. And because of this dynamic, we must look at them as permanent and not temporary rentiers. These are not temporary rentiers in the sense of what the literature told us. Again, this, one, this company that innovates get an innovation rent, then everyone catches up and someone else leapfrogs, and now this other company is the one that has the innovation rent, and so on and so forth. These are permanent rentiers and are also proactive rentiers. These are companies that are not just waiting to see how the rent flows into their pockets, but proactively engage, but they're extremely proactively engaged in planning the economy and in planning the production of new knowledge and how they are capturing that new knowledge. And we will see more of this throughout the seminar. Two important caveats. One, this goes way beyond intellectual property rights. I've been saying it already, and I think that the two crucial things to look at are what I uh, decided to call from today's seminar onwards, uh, intangible assortment strategy. I, uh, comp retails, uh, retailers use this idea of product, uh, product assortment strategy, which basically refers to the diversity of products they will have and how many of each of those products they will have. So try to uh, find the basket that maximizes its, their chances to sell, basically. So you go to the shop in the corner, and it has an assortment that it was decided in some way that led to have the, that particular product assortment strategy. What I will argue is that intellectual monopolies have an intangible assortment strategy in the sense that they also manage, plan, or control the type of intangibles they will have and complement them. So for some things, some pieces of, think of all the knowledge that they control as a very large puzzle. And each piece will be uh, controlled in, with a different knowledge mechanism. Sometimes they, these pieces will be uh, appropriated with patents or other intellectual property rights. Sometimes there will be pieces put in open source. Sometimes there will be pieces that move so fast that really doesn't matter if people find out what's going on or not, and just it's the matter of the speed at which the innovation is taking place, what guarantees that um, nobody can catch up. And many will be kept secret. Many, many pieces will be also kept secret. So it's about the capacity to recombine the pieces. It's not necessarily a capacity to produce them all, but a capacity to recombine the pieces and control who's doing what what will be crucial for the perpetuation of intellectual monopolies. And these are, diff are what I, when I say intellectual monopoly, I'm not referring to these companies as market monopolies. But let's, uh, I will get back to this in one second, but let's move on to the second topic of the day, which is that they plan. They plan means that they are organizing labor, not only inside the company, because companies, oh, in principle, always plan. Although we don't speak in economics much about planning, inside the firm, what we see is that things take place according to a certain plan. It's not that you go to work somewhere and you can do whatever you want during the time you're working there. No, you have certain tasks, uh, you have certain metrics that will evaluate you, assess you according to the goals that were set. So inside the firm, the way in which the division of labor works, what is called the technical division of labor, is according to a plan. But in principle, outside of the firm, we live in the anarchy of capitalism. And the markets are not planned. By definition, they are the opposite of something that is planned. And they are places where, again, in principle, there is a voluntary encounter of different economic actors. 
What we see with global value chains, with the franchising model, with platforms, are different examples of how a leading corporation, by capturing the, capturing the crucial intangibles of the whole industry or sector or portion of capitalism's production processes, manages also to plan to control the labor process in spaces, in companies that it doesn't formally own, it doesn't legally own, but it can still control economically as if it owned them. And this happens also with the innovation process. And this is why, uh, together with other colleagues, we've been using the concept of corporate innovation system. So an innovation system where, as in, as in any case of an innovation system, knowledge is co-produced by the different actors participating in the system, the articulation between the actors matters the most, but those defining who is producing what, what are the R&D orientations, who's participating and who's not, and who knows what, how information flows, and so on and so forth, will be uh, the company exercising an intellectual monopoly. So many will be participating in the co-production of knowledge, but only this intellectual monopoly will be controlling the whole process way beyond its R&D laboratories. And then it's also the intellectual monopoly, the one that will transform most of this knowledge into its intangible assets, will garner most of the associated rents. And this is why we can speak of knowledge, a knowledge predatory practice, because knowledge was co-produced, but then the profits are concentrated. So this leads us to different types of firms. The firms that participate in the corporate innovation system can be called innovating companies. They are typically the startup. If you've ever heard of cases of startups, think of them. But we can also see here universities, public research organizations participating also in corporate innovation systems. Typically, the aim of an inno innovative company of a startup will not be to reproduce commodities will be to sell a portion of knowledge when it's not directly sell itself to an intellectual monopoly. Whereas there are other types of subordinate firms, and I uh, usually call them early adopters and laggards, that basically participate in the reproduction of different commodities under the control of the intellectual monopoly. Why? Because they lack the necessary knowledge to be technologically autonomous and they depend on the knowledge that is controlled by the intellectual monopoly to produce. So different ways to say the same thing. So in principle and very schematically, they will not be contributing with new knowledge. They can, and, so, and actually sometimes they do, in subordinate ways, but just to be very schematic, so you can think, for instance, of Foxconn in its relation with Apple, or FedEx and UPS in the logistics system of Amazon, or Apple Hospitality, uh, in relation to Hilton and Marriott, it is part of a franchising model as uh, examples of early adopters. The early adopters have some technological capacities, do produce some technological uh, uh, innovations like, that could be usually considered as process innovations, but always within the large umbrella of the knowledge and research that is needed to produce what the intellectual monopoly wants, basically. So Foxconn quickly adapts its production, its, its production to the needs of companies like Apple, uh, but cannot produce beyond what it's assembling or manufacturing for these and other companies. And the Lagarde companies basically survive on the basis of uh, super exploiting their workers. That doesn't mean that the early adopters don't do it. Often they do it as well. Uh, but they, in the case of the Lagarde ones, they, the way to compensate and still have some profits uh, compensate for their technological laggardness is by worsening working conditions, paying lower salaries, and so on. So you can already see how inequalities connect with this framework. Some of you that come from the uh, major A may be thinking, okay, in the end she's speaking about Schumpeter Mark II. No, <laughs> this is not Schumpeter Mark II. In the economics of innovation literature, there, is, there are different ways to try to, let's say, um, build models to think about how innovation takes place. And based on the early work and the late work of Schumpeter, there are two models that became very prominent. One is called Schumpeter Mark I, early work of Schumpeter. Schumpeter Mark II, late work of Schumpeter. In Schumpeter Mark I, uh, 
the idea is that innovation takes place following the, the creative disruption, uh, all the entrepreneurs, so with small companies, a lot of entry and exit in the market. Uh, uh, it's the, the innovation is very haphazard in the sense that anyone can innovate. And it's a very turbulent uh, model of innovation. Whereas Schumpeter Mark II is what Schumpeter developed when he saw the emergence of companies like Bell, or well, as AT&T with Bell Labs in particular, and others like you can think of IBM Research, eventually later, already when Schumpeter was dead, uh, Intel Capital or Intel Labs actually, and so on. So these are like huge companies that have enormous R&D laboratories. I was talking uh, with someone that uh, after wor before working 20 years for TSMC, worked for Bell Laboratories, and he was telling me, I was like, okay, but why didn't you want to go to a university? And he was like, here we had the brightest minds in the world, all the resources we could ask for, a lot of freedom to do the research that we wanted. We were 20,000 researchers doing whatever we wanted while at the same time universities were becoming a space of control where you needed to be productive, deliver papers, it was harder to get the necessary funding and so on and so forth. Not that I'm promoting particularly to leave academia and work for a private company, but I, am, I do feel that we need to reflect a lot on so on why as these people in that er era and all the AI scientists and engineers today that work for Google and Microsoft, we need to understand also why working at the university is more and more complicated. So these were the examples of Schumpeter Mark II. Huge laboratories, they were like big companies, and eventually what they were developing as new innovations was also adopted widely by the industry. And this is important. Because once adoption takes place, new innovations, complementary innovations occur. By adopting technologies, other firms innovate. And then a new innovation takes place also in Schumpeter Mark II, maybe by the same firm, by another mm -hmm. firm, that's not an issue. But we always get this cycle of knowledge being produced inside the big R&D laboratory, eventually adopted in a longer period of time, so rents last for longer periods of time, but anyway, eventually adopted by the industry, and once that takes place, someone else or the, thing, the same firm innovates again and the process restarts. In this process, we have economic growth because we have innovation, diffusion, and that is supposed to be explaining economic growth for uh, mostly every model, uh, again, in economics, and we also have the idea that innovation is produced inside the firm. In the case of intellectual monopolies, this is not what is happening. Although the companies that are intellectual monopolies do produce part of the R&D inside their laboratories, inside their uh, part of the code is done effectively by, let's say, Google or Microsoft employees, a big chunk of it is being done by many others. And this is why when we look at some indicators of different patterns of innovation, we can identify something different. The typical way to identify a Mark II was by having a high stability of the top with a lot of concentration of the patents that those at the top uh, could capture. And you can see here, both a proxy for ICT technologies, in particular the software side, and pharmaceutical industry that in comparison with a classical case of Mark II, which is engines, pumps, and turbines, there is a relative stability of the top, especially when compared to fertilizers, which operates as Mark I, so a lot of entry and exit, and uh, a lot of turbulence, and not a lot of concentration of uh, the patents. So you can see here that the number of organizations that were in two periods of time, that were 2013 and 2022, that were in the top 10, for instance, in the pharmaceutical industry, these seven means that the top 10 organizations patenting in this sector in 2013, from these 10, seven appeared again in the top 10 in 2022. These 15 is from the 20 companies that were in the top 10 of companies uh, patenting in, pharma in the pharmaceutical, of organizations patenting in the pharmaceutical sector in 2013, 15 appeared again in 2022. The, the fact that here we only have a four is explained by China, and we can come back to this later on. It's not that the, com it's the case of China is very, very specific, and it's also a case of how a country 
developed or created its own intellectual monopolies, and we will get there. But let's look at the concentration also. The top 1% of patent assignees, for instance, in 2013, concentrated in the case of uh, electric digital, digital data processing, 61% of the patents. 1% of the patent assigning 61% of the patents. And now this is 60% in 2022. So it's not that it has decreased. However, when we go and look at the entry rates, there are thousands of companies entering these sectors or in terms of new patent assignees. And the rate of entry is quite high. It's not as high, of course, as Mark 1. When you have a lot of concentration of the patents in the top, of course, you cannot expect having the same shares of entry. <clears throat> but these shares of entry are definitely higher than those of other sectors. So here, basically, what we are having is some insight on the coexistence of a stable core with a very, very, very turbulent periphery. So there is a hierarchy, a stable hierarchy of the innovators, those at the top typically remain at the top. And then we have a lot of other actors that are entering and exiting with a lot of turbulence. And this combination is, a, in a way, a combination, if you want, of Mark I and Mark II, is explained by intellectual monopolization. And all this to insist that this doesn't mean, because we're looking at patents here, this doesn't mean that those operating like Schumpeter Mark II do not exhibit intellectual monopoly relations in the production process. These companies typically organize uh, companies like Siemens, for instance, organize global value chains and have the exclusive know-how of who can access what and know what and do what within the value chain. And this is also a form of intellectual monopoly. It's just that they're not so intensive in science and technology and the new technological developments usually are, remain associated with the machine, with the production of the machine, and it's not so easy to outsource them as uh, it is for the case of tech and pharma. And the other important thing to say is that patents are actually not the main appropriation mechanism in the case of ICT, and we will come back to this in one second, uh, because the situation is even worse than what is depicted here. But before that, let me give you some insights on uh, knowledge predation. And here you have Roche. And um, I will show you in a second the same type of analysis for Microsoft. What I've been doing on this regard is looking at co-authorships and compare that with co-ownership of patents. Because these companies publish a lot of scientific papers, we can proxy the, comp the other organizations that are participating in the co-production of knowledge with them by looking and networks of co-authorship. And we can also look at the topics they are working on. And when we compare the co-authorships with the co-ownerships, basically what we see is that they co-author widely and they co-own with just a few. And the co-ownerships are generally with other firms or other, in this case, uh, some pharma companies, but usually they are not with universities or public organizations and so on, although they do produce a lot of uh, research together. In this map that for some reason is not plotted in the best way, so it's not that you are getting blind, it's that the, the plot is not very good. Um, here, and, and every time I've been doing this for the last four or five years, there is always a cluster that shows strong collaborations among pharma companies. So here we have Pfizer, uh, we have Amgen, Avi, Bristol Myers, Bayer, Sanofi, and this is a map of the most frequent co-authors, the 150 most frequent co-authors of Bosch. So this means that pharma companies work together for something. I can come back to what this something is, but I don't want to divert at this point, and we've been uh, already taking too long for the first part, so I need to move on. But this is important, and just keep it in mind. Also, uh, the same can be shown for the case of Microsoft. Here you have it clearly, like in the same period, uh, Microsoft co-owned, uh, co-authored 88% of its scientific papers and only co-owned 1% of its patents. If you also consider that actually a lot of the knowledge is kept secret, the situation is even worse. Yes? So it's new patents, co-ownership, or it's... Old the patents. inventions that were patented in the same period. Okay. So with new patents, but it doesn't matter. Like, let me just say that it doesn't matter when you look at the whole history of the patents of the companies. They patent alone, and they publish with many other organizations. Sorry, can I ask a question about sure. the technology? Sure. Uh, 
Sorry. It's a bit long. So I will leave it for the Q&A, if you don't mind. The methodology is basic network analysis. Um, and what I'm doing is depicting the real co-authorships. I'm, I'm not building them on the basis, for instance, of references, who's quoting whom. It's who co-authored with whom. Because what I want to know is who worked with whom. I don't care if they were influenced by the research of. No, I'm, I care about a researcher from Microsoft working together with a researcher from the China's Academy of Science. So before moving on, and, and I can come back, of course, to the methodology later on, uh, before moving on talking about these knowledge predatory practices, I want to take you, like zoom out a bit from tech and pharma and try to give you a hint of how can we identify and classify intellectual monopolies. So I already convinced you that some companies, at least, I or I expect so, from the tech and the pharma sector are operating in this way. But I also anticipated that this is not exclusive of pharma and tech. Therefore, we cannot be doing one study case after another and another with every single company in the world. So we need to find indicators and easy ways to show that this dynamic is taking place. What is this dynamic ultimately? It's a combination of two things. Concentration of intangible assets with some effects associated with it at the market level. Not necessarily being the only one in the market, but we need to see some market concentration. So let's first look at intangibles concentration. And for this, I will first focus on two types of intangibles. I will focus on business expenditure on R&D, so R&D, science-based uh, uh, investment. So typically, we can uh, expect there to see companies like pharma, tech, and so on. But also, another type of intangible that we, should, we must be considering, especially these days, are brands. And the brands, in a way, are the identity of the firm, are the, the ID of the firm. Nestlé is its brands, Procter & Gamble is its brands, Coca-Cola is Coca-Cola. And the same we can say of PepsiCo and many others. And for these companies, science and technology investment may not be as relevant because the type of intangibles that they are building also outsourcing part of the renewal of those intangibles in marketing agencies, for instance, are of another type. So a way to look at this uh, very, very, like in, in a very fast and, and simple way is to say, okay, let's look at the sample, which in my case I chose the 50 largest companies in market capitalization plus 16 others for comparison. For comparisons, why is it 16 or 17? Why 17? Because I added 15 that were listed companies to expand the number of countries that were represented in the top 50, because otherwise I would have ended with like three countries. So I added some companies from Spain, I added some companies from Germany, and I also wanted at least one company from Latin America, so I added Mercado Libre, so I did a bit of that with, the, with 15. And there are two others, IKEA and Huawei, that to me seem also to be intellectual monopolies. The first one more of the science-based side at least, and the latter more about brands and, and other types of intangibles that, that are not listed companies. So they cannot be among the top 50 because they are not listed companies. And so I added them as well. And I looked at whether these companies were in the top 100 uh, companies or organizations in terms of business expenditure and R&D, and whether they were among the top 100 brands following Forbes uh, ranking of brands. And this is what I found. I found four types of companies. Some that do not seem to be concentrating in tangible assets. And yes, of course, like here we have some of them like Saudi Aramco, Shell, Exxon, ICBC. Uh, in particular, well, let's not consider ICBC, that is a bank, but all the others are uh, energy companies. They are concentrating, as I anticipated, another type of resource, which is nature. The Uber has... Um, is highlighted just uh, because it was, I think, 101 or 102 in business expenditure in R&D. So it was quite close to be included in, in another part of, of this figure. And then we have some companies that are more inclined towards science-based science concentration. Others that are more inclined towards brand-based concentration. This doesn't mean that they are not also investing in the other thing. 
that let's say for instance Alibaba doesn't care about its brand. It's just that it's not among the largest brands in the world in terms of like this ranking of brands. And then we have this intangible base concentration that is basically being at both the top 100 in business expenditure and R&D and top 100 in uh, brands. Uh, and here, I particularly highlighted some companies because we will see in one second that these are also the ones that are concentrating the most uh, market dimensions. So let's move on and go precisely to how to think of market concentration. Market concentration can be looked in two different ways. One is depth. So we look at the main sector of operation. These companies produce many things or uh, their subcontractors produce it but sell many things. So how do we look at market concentration? So one of the things that uh, I did was to look at the main segment of operation in terms of revenues from, for all these companies and look at their market share. And look also at whether, in some cases, the market is not that concentrated, but they were still the first ones. So if I was either considering having high depth, if they had either a market share that was above the median market share, or if they were the first ones, like ranking first in uh, terms of market share in their main segment of operation. But the other thing that can happen is that these companies, because intangibles, can be reused for many things that are not necessarily the same market. Coca-Cola is a beverage, and typically one would expect it to be just a beverage. But in some cases, as there are many, many brands that refer to many, many sectors in the economy. So, and the same can happen with uh, many companies that are more science-based, that are entering a wide diversity of sectors. So another alternative could be that they use their intangibles to enter more markets. So how can we proxy the number of markets in which these companies are? Because defining this, the extent, the frontiers of the market is quite complex. And it opens a whole, like a Pandora box of discussions. So the thing that I did was to proxy it with trademarks. If a company registers more trademarks, in principle, we can think that it's entering more markets. Otherwise, you just keep your Coca-Cola brand for one thing and that's it. But if you're also uh, registering, I don't know, Danzani and, and Fanta and Sprite and so on, okay, you're having more products and potentially entering more markets. And I looked at trademarks from three different sources because it, they, none is as good as in the case of patents, for instance, which is a reason why only a few people look at trademarks. Calling these two dimensions uh, depth and breadth, we can now see the companies organized or classified in another way. And in terms of market concentration, see that there are three types of market concentration. The embracers, which are basically companies that are entering many markets, but do not concentrate a large share of any of them. The squeezers, which are companies that focus their business in one thing, but they are like at the forefront and have a high share of the market. Think of TSMC, for instance, NVIDIA. And then we have the emperors, which are those that are both uh, having high depth and high uh, breadth. And this is why I highlighted before these five, because these are the only, or six, not five, six, because these are the only six that are both emperors and intangible, and have intangible base concentration. And there are some companies that although they are ranking, ranking high in terms of uh, market capitalization, actually, this is not coupled with any form of uh, market concentration. So this is why I call them tight uh, workers, and we can discuss about them later if you're interested. But now let's look at the intellectual monopolies. So to be an intellectual monopoly, the company needs to, at the same time, be concentrating intangibles, be them brands, science and technology, or both, and have some form of market concentration be it breadth, depth, or both. And again, we can here have some uh, preliminary results on this where some companies are super concentrating markets and intangibles, and we can call them intellectual monopolies on asteroids and other types of intellectual monopolies. What I want to highlight here is that I looked at only two of the, let's say, relevant intangibles, and a third one is data concentration. But there are no proxies for data concentration at the firm level. 
at least not so far. We, we are working on one, but uh, it's not ready. But we do know a bit about data concentration in particular for some firms. And we can say that from these six, and this was also verified in interviews that I've been doing, something that I didn't say is that I will be showing you some parts of interviews. And these interviews, I've been doing so far 85 interviews with scientists, engineers, and high rank managers from these companies. And um, basically, it's Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft, the ones that we can say that are really concentrating the more, most diverse and uh, vast big data sets among these six. Huawei and Samsung are not companies that are typically associated with big data gathering. So there is already another difference in terms of these six, which refers to data concentration. So what is so special about US big tech? And to answer this, I will also be looking at some Chinese companies very, very quickly. And the first thing that one can say, this is before ChatGPT, this is 2014, 2019, is the, is a text mining analysis of the content of these companies' uh, scientific publications. And you can clearly see that the most frequent terms that appear in their publications refer already to artificial intelligence, in particular, to machine learning and to a specific approach that is the deep neural networks that is the mainstream these days and, we did, and, and it is within the realm of uh, or, or the large umbrella of what uh, generative AI is doing, which is that these are algorithms that improve by themselves. They learn the more data they process. So if we think of them as means of production, this means that they are means of production that appreciate the more we use them. And instead of what happens to all the other means of production in the world, that the more they are used, they depreciate. And of course, the other thing that we can clearly see here is that AI is not a standalone technology, that coding the algorithms by themselves mean nothing. You need to have data and you also need, and I will come back to this later on, the processing power. But in the papers, it's clear that together with the keywords referring to AI, we have keywords referring to data and to the applications of AI like natural language. And because of all this handling of data and AI, the capacities to plan the economy further expand. And uh, we can, again, as I say, everything that I'm saying can be double clicked and we can come back to that if you want to. One could say, okay, these companies were focused on AI, but at the same time, there were so many other organizations, and there are even today other organizations focused on AI. So what's the deal? I mean, yes, they are focusing on AI. And so here, what I'm plotting is the top 14 AI conferences between 2018 and 2020. And this are, is the network of the organizations that are more frequently presenting papers in these conferences. This is Microsoft. This is Alphabet. You have here Facebook. Amazon is not that important. I can come back to why Microsoft, uh, why Amazon uh, is strategically deciding not to participate that much in these events. It has a corporate innovation system that uh, is aimed at keeping more pieces secret than the rest. But what is clear is that at least Microsoft and Alphabet, and to um, a lesser extent Facebook, are the most important entities in this network. They have what in network analysis is called as the highest betweenness centrality. It doesn't matter the technicality here, just to say that this is a, an indicator used to measure which are the most important nodes, the most important entities in a network. And they're not only important in terms of how they can influence the whole research that is being done by being crucial nodes in the network, but also geopolitically. Because Microsoft over here, belongs to a cluster, and these red clusters over here are mostly what can be described as China's AI innovation system. Whereas all these clusters are mostly integrated by organizations from the West. So what we see here is that the frontier AI is organized around two big groups. One is China, and what's happening there is highly influenced by Microsoft. And the other one is the West, that is also highly influenced by Microsoft and also by Alphabet and Facebook. So the frontier AI research, even before, again, is, this is, comes up to 2020, ChatGPT, is highly driven by the decisions of these companies. And this is sci frontier science at top AI conferences. Again, one could say, okay, 
they are influencing a lot the um, development of science, but what about the appropriation of that AI and how they are monetizing it? Yes. In this case, since we're talking about conferences, the links represent uh, uh, co-organization. Always co-participation. Co but no, no, the links represent always co-authorships, in this case, of papers presented in conferences. Okay. Let's say I go to a conference okay. and present a paper with Cedric. Cedric is at the University of Geneva, so there will be a link. It's not automatic because it's the, there is a minimum threshold to build a link. But let's say we, a lot of people from UCL and Geneva are presenting together papers at that conference, there will be a link. Well, so what happens at the level of patents? Are they appropriating all this knowledge? And we come here and we see, oh, not really. Toyota is appropriating all this knowledge. What happened here? We were all worried about Microsoft and Google and what happened with OpenAI, and actually Toyota was the key company in AI in the end. No, what happened is that patents are not giving us the right information. Again, patents are not the main appropriation mechanism in AI. They are keeping secret and the things move so fast that they don't care. There is no point in patenting, there is no point in thinking about how are you going to protect. Nobody understands what even if they show us the model. We invite here someone from OpenAI and they show us the parameters of the, that are behind the GPT-4 that, uh, that powers uh, ChatGPT plus and it's like, okay, thank you. It's like having someone speaking in Chinese to all of us, except for those that are Chinese in the room. You can, at least those can translate to all of us. So there is definitely something happening here. And what is happening here, and this is why complementing all these network analysis, text mining, blah, 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 with interviews has been so instrumental, so useful for my research, because it also enabled me to, in a way, get some evidence of what was kind of like my analysis telling me, but I couldn't say in another way. Because if in the end these companies are not patenting, but they are publishing a lot, thank you very much, Microsoft, for sharing all your research with us. And what's basically happening is they are, a lot of this is kept secret. And even for the companies that were publishing more, like Google DeepMind, since the release of ChatGPT, people were already saying, and this was just as like this interview took place in 2022, and just like late, like December 2022, and the person was already telling me, we will, it's obvious that we will keep more things secret. We will publish things, but reports that are not peer reviewed, and therefore we are not forced in any way to disclose things that we don't want to disclose, and we just share the necessary for our technology to be adopted widely. So how do they appropriate the knowledge? And one of the things that I've also noticed and, and that is crucial and goes back to the discussion of Bell Labs refers to double affiliations. So if someone doesn't want to leave the university, these companies have a deal to offer, especially for professors, like younger people, postdocs and so on will move to the company. But big tech companies also offer the most known and expert professors in AI in the world, the option to have a double affiliation, which means that they work part-time for the company and part-time at the university, or at least that's how they sell it. In reality, basically, the, all the knowledge they are producing flows one way, which is towards the company, whereas they have non-disclosure agreements that prevent them from using any of that for anything else. So they, and they get sometimes even access to things that people that are working for the company don't know. There is also a very established way of thinking about information flows that says that inside the organization, information flows freely, flows freely, whereas in the market and elsewhere, it's prices what give you the information, but there is no information flow. Well, all this, it's, to say the least, a lie. Because basically, inside all these gigantic organizations, it's manage up to the most like detail degree that you cannot even imagine who knows what they operate under what is called a need to know basis and this means that if you need to know you will know but if you don't you will not know so this helps them to manage first of all what happens when people leave the company but also to prevent the the leaks of their intellect and that could be harmful for the intellectual monopoly so basically I talked to people that were in very high ranking rank positions telling me, 
I don't know what my employees are working on. I mean, I can know generally the title of the project or, or not even, but I don't know the details of what they are doing. And this is a way, and of course the employees don't know why they are doing what they are doing and don't know what others are doing. So sometimes these double affiliations end up knowing more of certain projects, of course, that they need to know. But again, they cannot tell you about it because they have very strict non-disclosure agreements. And what you have here are the number of organizations that I found in this subset of uh, conference papers. There were a lot of people signing at the same time the same paper with the name of one of these companies and the university. It's not that in a paper in 2018 they signed with one affiliation, like I was at City University of London before, so let's say I have papers with that affiliation and now I have papers with UCL affiliation. That's, that's not a double affiliation. That's a movement from one place to the other and there are papers that analyze that as well and, and the brain drain from academia to the companies. But on top of that there is also this double affiliation dynamic. And to move faster, because the idea would be not to finish uh, later than in 15 minutes, or maybe less. Uh, they also control and capture uh, knowledge from the open source. And this can be paradigmatic because the open source was in principle developed precisely to counterbalance intellectual monopolization. But because they decide the strategic pieces that they will share and who they will be sharing what uh, type of knowledge, they can also profit from the open source environment where everyone contributes and then they harvest the knowledge and introduce it and make sense of that knowledge in ways that nobody else can make sense because all the other pieces are not part of the op what was put in open source. And at the same time, by doing it, by putting some languages and infrastructures in open source, they become the norm or the standards in the industry. So it's not only capturing free labor of developers, but it's also strengthening their capacity to control the whole field. And what you have here is just an indicator of code capture by looking at projects that were put in open source by these companies and the number of contributors and how larger they, these numbers of contributors are in comparison with the number of people that are working for the companies that are registered on this uh, developer's platform. Yes? So you are constantly referring to a they that make these decisions and what you're saying is that the companies are not homogeneous in terms of information access, distributing power. So who exactly is the they? Some is the high rank is the, is the C level basically? What ends up deciding is the C level. The C level are the CEO, CTO, CFO, CEO. So are the high, high, high rank managers. Sometimes the workers, the, those that are the scientists doing the AI, try to persuade the managers to put things in open source. So this is also why it says. Uh, keep employees happy as a reason why they do it because some developers want to do it but a lot of people from Google were for instance telling me that more often than not it's like a hassle to put things in open source they could put part of it in open source but because they program everything already with a lot of like people from DeepMind in particular were telling me that because they program ev everything using a lot of Google internal tools you need to re like rewrite the whole code again to put it in open source. And once you put it in open source, you need to keep track of it. And, and in a way, you are responsible for maintaining the code. And it's because of that that sometimes, even if they want to, they don't do it. And when they do it, it's a strategic decision. It's like, we, like Android is a very um, known case of how it helped Google to strengthen its position, not only in the smartphone industry, but beyond, because part of like, Google's so-called strategic partnership with Renault includes these days using Android for the uh, cars of the future, for instance. So I can come back to this later on, but the day in a way are, you can ultimately say these are the C-level. Of course, in agreement with the board, mm -hmm. that's, it's, there is a constant uh, back and forth, if you want, in a way. But those making ultimately the decisions of how those larger takes of how the company will evolve in concrete terms, what the, this knowledge management pieces will be the C-level, the vice presidents also. The vice president of research at IBM was deciding of the hardware part was deciding certain things, the vice president of research in terms of software deciding others and so on. Is the C-level even more powerful than the board when it comes to these decisions? I think that that's not a question that can be answered actually. I mean, it's, uh, 
every power relation ends up being, you, for, to understand power relations, you need to understand the context. And to understand the context is very company specific. So it depends on how the company is a structure and organized at different moments. Clearly, both will have the chance to decide. But the board will know much less than what the C-level, including the vice presidents, know. So it's, it's quite complex, I would say, to clearly define the day, like up to where? Up to the vice presidents or those that can be low as well are counting? Well, it depends. It depends on what uh, decision you're talking about. Another way in which these companies control without owning how knowledge is produced is using corporate venture capital to get privileged access to knowledge. And this is an extended um, practice, not only by big tech, but also by other companies in the tech sector with different degrees. And here you have multiple companies and you can see from Broadcom with only uh, four companies and Alphabet with almost 900 companies. Uh, that were backed by them in, by October 2023. Actually, they were backing many more companies, but these are just a number of companies for which, let's say, Alphabet's investment was among its top five investors. What the money that Alphabet, so Google, was doing, was giving to 859 companies resulted in Alphabet being among these eight, 859 companies, top five investors. There were other companies that also received Google money, but received more money from others, and therefore Google was not among the top five investors. So it's not only relevant to look at acquisitions, which is what mostly uh, the history of, uh, of economics of innovation and, others, uh, and other subfields within economics has been looking at, but also at this form of control uh, without ownership. That, uh, and this includes not only direct investments, but other forms of investments that I will mention in one second. But here you have more info on that. For some reason, I already put something there that is not there. It is there now. OK, so here you uh, have who are the top five investors of um, all the AI startups by April 2023. Because again, these companies could be investing in a lot of startups. But in the end, how relevant are they? Let's narrow it down to AI. And you can find Microsoft over here. You can find also Alibaba, Baidu. Interesting that Microsoft is in the same cluster as the other, as the Chinese tech companies. You can also find Amazon and Google over here, and even Samsung, Intel, and others. So they are very important actors in the venture capital realm when it comes to AI. These are the organizations or the companies in the end that are funding more AI startups from the world, at least from this data set. And among them, among the uh, SoftBank and others, so firms that were created as investment funds or as venture capital, we also find big tech companies. And of course, the most paradigmatic case these days of uh, corporate venture capital is how Microsoft, since 2019, funded, uh, provided money, $1 billion, to OpenAI. And this resulted in Microsoft controlling the development of the technology, having privileged access to it way in advance, or sometimes having access that others cannot have access to, such as uh, originally GPT-3. It was also Microsoft who pushed OpenAI to develop ChatGPT and who knew that, because it was pushing for it, that that was taking place way in advance and therefore had time to introduce ChatGPT to all its products. And here you have one um, uh, short sentence from one of the interviews I did with people from Microsoft where clearly uh, they were telling me this was a strategic decision. We didn't want to acquire OpenAI because by not acquiring it, we win when OpenAI is even selling ChatGPT to our competitors that would not feel so comfortable at buying ChatGPT from Microsoft, such as Salesforce, but that are totally fine with having a deal with OpenAI. And also, by investing without owning, they reduce risks. They reduce economic risk, and they still control the development of the technology. Why? Because they still have not only the data, but they also have all the processing power, all the processing power almost of the world. And 
On top of that, they have the knowledge to transform a large language model, let's use this example, into business products. Again, remember what we were saying in the beginning. You have the knowledge, you need to translate it into business products. It's not automatically an innovation. And Google, Amazon, and Microsoft in particular have the capacity to control those transformations, not only by developing in-house, but again, outsourcing portions of this. So with Cédric Durand and, and Anna Van Susen, we are working on this idea of the means of information and knowledge appropriation, the MICA. And the MICAs are relevant because the MICAs are tangible assets that are indispensable for capturing the intangibles. The intangibles do have a materiality in the end, of course. The data needs to be stored somewhere. The AI models need to be trained, need to be processed. Further analysis needs to be done. And all that takes place in tangible assets. And those having those tangible assets, in particular in relation to AI, that it, uh, the more processing power you have, the larger the data set, the better the outcomes you will have in terms of the model. Those concentrating all these other intangible assets will be in a privileged position because they de-risk from what is risky, coding the new large language models, developing large language models that are better than those that already exist, and concentrate what is always a win, what, is can, be, what can be called to be a win-win. It doesn't matter if OpenAI succeeds or fails. There are many other startups developing large language models. They will all need to come to the clouds of these companies and the clouds uh, and the cloud in particular is a highly concentrated market. We were talking before about market concentration. Amazon, Google, and Microsoft together concentrate around 65% of the world's cloud computing market. And if we exclude China, the concentration is much larger because the only reason why Alibaba is here is because it's the main operator in China. And the cloud is not just a means to adopt technology and use technology but it's also a way to reinforce these companies' intellectual monopolies. Why? Because everything that is sold on the cloud is sold as a black box. Nobody can really read the lines of code of what's inside. And therefore, the chances of learning by doing, of doing reverse engineering, forget about it, of course are reduced, while the more data is uh, processed with the AI algorithms that are offered as software as a service by these companies, higher the chances that these algorithms will get better, even if no one from these companies is sneaking into the data, just because the way in which algorithms are trained and used uh, make them better over the more data they process. Again, I insist the cloud is crucial for one thing that I said before, recombining modules. The cloud sells pieces of software and pieces and access, rents access to pieces of hardware. So it's the example of recombination by excellence. And to the point where other companies like Mercado Libre, that is an e-commerce and fintech platform in Latin America, relies on Amazon, so the e-commerce world leader, to do part of its data processing, to access AI algorithms and so on that are at the core of its business. And I use the case of Mercado Libre to reflect a bit very, very quickly uh, in terms of whether this is just another chapter of the dependency theory, those of you familiarized with it, one of the crucial dimensions is to analyze technological dependence and how peripheral countries depend on the technology that is developed in the north. And because of that dependence, they end up accepting unequal value exchanges. So the appropriation and capture of more value produced in the south by the north because they need access to the technology and also further nature extractivism. So is this just this uh, case of further uh, uh, knowledge uh, being encapsulated by the North and then sold to the South? Well, actually, it's not necessarily that case because one of the things that I was mentioning before is that knowledge, the production of knowledge, is done by many. And so many that has globalized. And organizations from all around the world produce knowledge. And we all produce data as we speak. No matter where we are around the world, we are all producing data. So in fact, what's happening is that the data and the knowledge are produced widely all around the world. But the monetization, the transformation of all these intangibles into intangible assets takes place in uh, a few firms that are usually firms from the global north or more accurately from the core, because we have China also entering the core. And there is something else to say, which is that we are not just simply in a situation in which local capitals are technological laggards. 
companies like Mercado Libre do have a lot of internal capacities to analyze and process data and are also at the knowledge frontier in a specific realms, in a specific subfields related, for instance, with fraud detection, with uh, targeting a specific uh, user experiences in their platforms and so on, but still depend on part of the technology that is accessed on the cloud and they use it to further subordinate those below. So this is why we can think of layers of core and peripheries. And this is not only something specific of Mercado Libre, this is something more general. And I will squeeze, or I, I will skip all this, which are just some indicators of how Siemens, in one point of its history, tried also to be a master in ICT technologies, but ended up leaving that aside and now depends on the Googles and so on for everything that relates to its business. To say that this form of cannibalism is not exclusive of Siemens, but I've been noticing it widely in all the interviews that I've been doing at companies that are not the big tech. And they start to see and be worried about the relevance of the cloud for their businesses, the centrality of digital technologies for their businesses, how digital technologies are complementary to, let's say, brand building, how digital technologies are used to re to rethink about a new method of innovation in healthcare, for instance. So they become also crucial for pharma companies, for companies from every single sector. And they have so many data and so many information that they end up depending more and more on the cloud to process it. So this leads us to situations where it's not just Mercado Libre exhibiting that uh, layered structure where Mercado Libre depended on the big tech and use that to subordinate those below, but also ultimately many other intellectual monopolies from also core countries are becoming strategically dependent on big tech companies to operate. And you have here also different parts of some interviews. Let me just refer to this one. This, uh, this is a person that was working at this company and before it worked for a big tech. And what we discussed because of what this company is doing was uh, the tension between flexibility and what is described as a stickiness. So basically, a stickiness is the locking effect. So how a cloud provider codes in a specific ways so that it's harder for any user, be it Coca-Cola or a small startup, to leave the cloud. So it is possible in principle to leave it, but it's so expensive to do it, so time consuming that you will be kind of reluctant to do it and accept, therefore, the conditions of your cloud provider. And what companies want, as uh, this person was saying to me, is flexibility. But the cloud providers want the stickiness. I even interviewed someone whose job was to create a stickiness at Amazon Web Services. And of course, it is hard to depend. But at the same time, it is beneficial to depend because the access to all these frontier technologies, think of McDonald's accessing in almost one, two clicks to the data of all the stores that are part of its franchisee model to analyze it with AI and further send commands to every single store on what they have to do. So their capacity to squeeze value from workers, to sell more, to control more all the franchisees expands with digital technologies. So it's a strategic form of dependence because they need the technologies offered by big tech to reinforce their own intellectual monopolies. And it's dangerous, and I will finish with this and just sum up, it's dangerous because at the same time, big tech companies are entering multiple sectors in the world entering the pharma sector, have entered the payment sector and others. They are using their intangibles to enter sectors that they, they privilege precisely because they are also sources of potential intangibles and also sources of data in particular. So although they speak all the time about partnerships, these are not real partnerships. They are, these are much more complex relations. And these relations certainly are not market relations. These are part of planning and control structures. This is just to conclude a brief depiction of capitalism, highlighting that there is not only a lot of flow of knowledge and data produced all around the world to the largest tech companies, but also an extraction of nature associated with the digital economy. And this is something that we always need to have in mind when we think about the economic effects. And that also, speaking of digital capitalism, requires us more and more to speak of other companies, such as the pharma companies I was referring before, such as companies from the financial sector, Siemens, and so on. So 
as effects, and I have two more slides and I will finish here. As uh, what, very briefly, as a, a sort of summary, in terms of effects of intellectual monopolization, we can think of industrial stratification, which was what we discussed in the beginning. Also how subordinate firms partially compensate the effects of intellectual monopolization by super exploiting workers. At the same time, we discuss a bit about this web of control. So if we have global value chains, a lot of separated global value chains, a lot of separated franchising models, a lot of platforms, when we start looking at how all these big companies and how all these intellectual monopolies relate to each other, we connect the networks, we connect all these substructures, and we find that the connection comes from the top and the relations they establish, so called by them strategic partnerships, but that can be actually renamed as some of the people that I interview call them frenemy relations. And uh, of course, this is, has a, a dimension when it comes to studying core and periphery dynamics. There are some geopolitical and economic reconfigurations. China, I mentioned, is part of the core. The EU, the, the Europe more in general, seems to be lagging behind and clearly is lagging behind in its capacity to turn knowledge into assets, not in its production of knowledge. Certainly, a lot of science and technology keeps being produced in Europe, but when it comes to digital technologies, they lack in their capacity to turn it into assets, and it's mostly uh, US and secondarily uh, Chinese companies doing it. But in terms of effects on the peripheries, we, also, we can also think of twin extractivism. And I can come back to this later on, which is something that we are working on also with Cédric Durand, which refers to how peripheral countries are not only the countries that are obliged to end up accepting nature extractivism as a way to get some dollars and compensate for their economic situation. And when we look at why they are, they are in this economic situation, they are in part in this economic situation because of intellectual monopolization. So the fact that even the knowledge that is produced in these countries ends up being captured and turned into assets by companies from the global north generates a pressure on these countries that force the countries to remain being like primary producers and extracting more and more nature. So it's kind of like a uh, a way to squeeze them from whatever it's possible. And at the system level, one thing that I uh, like subreptitiously mention is that whereas even in Mark II, one could think of eventually after innovation and diffusion, economic growth taking place, because innovation uh, and diffusion are delinked, the process of controlling knowledge and enabling others to use it without really accessing it reduces chances for diffusion that affects economic growth. Question mark, is it economic growth what we want? We can leave the question for later, but anyway, this is what is happening. So summing up and really finishing here. What we discussed today is basically this. That accumulation uh, today is being driven by intellectual monopolies and what they are doing is using their capacity to transform knowledge and data that is being co-produced by many into their intangible assets and then on the basis of those intangible assets control others that are producing steps of larger production processes and capture part of the value that is produced there. In particular, big tech are special and I provide you tons of uh, empirics on why they're special and why also, they differ to some degree in their corporate innovation systems. Some of them are more open, some of them are more secretive, but anyway, in the end, they are controlling the AI field and how the cloud further reinforces intellectual monopolization and these unequal relations also among intellectual monopolies. So with the Google, Amazon, and Microsoft at the top and the other intellectual monopolies becoming strategically dependent companies, the more they digitalize. And um, we basically, to sum up, uh, I think that these are the two crucial things to say. One, that intellectual monopolization is determining value flows and value capture, and that cannibalism and, and predation are two often and, and very frequent relations in contemporary capitalism. And one thing that we didn't discuss was this, but happy to discuss it later on. And I'm sorry it was a bit like long. <laughs>